Hi there. Thanks for joining me in this session on PrEP implementation for youth. Today I'll be talking about engaging adolescents in our PrEP services, the importance of managing stigma in this population, the challenge of managing parental consent requirements in this age group when accessing PrEP services, and helping them to navigate the PrEP delivery system. And once they have come into services, what challenges there are with keeping them with us. And finally, making sure that your team is equipped to support this important key population. This year in its annual data report, UNAIDS reported that a quarter of all new infections in the Asia Pacific region last year were in young people aged 15 to 24 years, highlighting the ongoing challenge for all of us that work in HIV prevention. I think a key question worth keeping in mind throughout this 20 minute session is we know from studies that PrEP is safe to use in adolescents. And in qualitative studies, adolescents have said themselves that it's a highly acceptable method for them to use for HIV prevention. Yet relatively few adolescents are actually using PrEP. So why is this? And what can we do as service providers to help to close this gap? Before I delve into the contents of this talk, I wanted to give you a brief overview of our PrEP services where I work at Chulalongkorn University. To date, we've cared for just over 300 adolescents using PrEP, and about 200 of these continue to use PrEP, most of between ages 18 to 24 years, and either men who have sex with men or transgender women with a small percentage of heterosexual serodiscordant couples. If you remember nothing else from this talk, I think a key word to successfully working with adolescents is peers. Coming to health services for anyone, but particularly young people, can be a very intimidating experience and meeting them where they are with their friends or chosen social group can really help with engaging them into services. At our centre, to enable this bonding to take place, we try as much as we can to organise camps and fun activities where adolescents will have a safe place to do this with other PrEP users. In this picture on this slide, you can see a group of our adolescents who were given just a few hours to prepare an evening entertainment session with their peers, which served as a very good bonding experience for them. And later on, it was these peers that supported them through the ongoing challenges of adolescents at risk of HIV. Some adolescents will choose to come to HIV prevention services by themselves. A substantial proportion will bring along significant others for moral support and ensuring your services are accommodating to this will help to support, engage, to support engagement in this population and optimize their health outcomes, whether it's helping a parent to understand the identity of their transgender adolescent, adjusting service delivery for transgender women who have shown us in our services that they prefer to receive their services in large groups together, and delivering HIV treatment and prevention care for serodiscordant couples at the same appointment. It's important to remember that stigma, whether it's for adolescents or adults, is a major issue and a barrier in accessing HIV prevention services. And our adolescents will experience not just gender related stigma, but HIV related stigma, sexual activity and promiscuity related stigma. And it's important to treat them with respect, to really focus on building trust and giving them the confidence that everything that is done in the sessions will be treated with a strictness of confidence. The need in many settings for a parental consent for adolescents under 18 years is a well-known barrier to accessing HIV prevention services. It's a mixed bag of legal, ethical and practical barriers. And in Thailand, we're fortunate that teenagers aged 18 sorry, 13 and above can consent to their own sexual and reproductive health services. And I hope that the data we collect from these studies in the younger adolescent age will inform policies of its safety and feasibility in the future to hopefully increase much needed access to HIV prevention service access in this population. I think it's important to work with what you do have. And if there are legal limitations to providing adolescent HIV prevention services in your settings, it's still worth thinking about what you can do and what you can offer in providing things like social workers to facilitate understanding parents and also providing information what services can be provided within your settings. Although navigation support and health services has traditionally been used 
in cancer and chronic disease care services, I think it's equally helpful in supporting adolescents to make the most of the services we're able to offer them in reducing their HIV risk. Navigation encompasses disease education, health system education, logistics coordination, and emotional support, all of which we have found adolescents can sometimes struggle to juggle on their own. On a typical adolescent clinic afternoon, we will always have adolescents who have gone to the wrong building, have turned up at the wrong time, and a bit overwhelmed on how to manage the side effects of medications we have recently prescribed. And this is reflected in this table showing topics that our adolescents typically contacted us on outside regular clinic hours for support from appointments to suspected sexually transmitted infections. Ensuring adolescents are supported with their navigation, I think, is a unique need of this age group that really helps them to stay engaged in our services. We carried out a study in 200 adolescent young men who have sex with men and transgender women last year, aged 15 to 19, who were at risk of HIV and provided them with PrEP for six months with monthly contact. Three quarters were MSM and the remaining transgender women. What we found on measuring PrEP adherence using tenofovir diphosphate dry blood spot levels was that young MSM were three to four times more likely to be adherent to PrEP than young transgender women. The findings of this study were published in JIS just last month, and I think the take home message from this is that further adaptations in your HIV prevention delivery services for transgender women versus men who have sex with men will help you to optimize PrEP adherence challenges, the details of which we intend to continue to study at our center. Following the completion of their first six months in the study, we continue to follow participants, the outcomes of which I will show you on the next slide. Uh, this has also been presented at a poster in APAC, and you can see that seven of the 200 participants in the study seroconverted following completion of the study at six months. No seroconversions actually occurred within the first six months. The figure you can see in this slide shows the timeline of these seven adolescents who seroconverted. Six were MSM and one was transgender women. Just to orientate you to this figure, the green bars show those with protective PrEP protection levels, yellow partial protection, and white non-protective or undetectable levels. The solid arrows are self-reported PrEP adherence and the dotted self-reported non-adherence. The green circles represent their last HIV negative test and the red circles represent when they were found to be HIV positive. The calculated HIV incidence rate was very high for those who report discontinuing PrEP at 15.7 per 100 person years. Although with monthly follow-up retention in the first six months was 73%, this dropped significantly to approximately 60, sorry, 20% when visits were reduced to quarterly visits, a finding seen in Sybil Hosek's team in the 27 ATN 1110 and 113 PrEP trials. I think the key take home message from this slide is that there's a window from their last engagement with our services and consequent zero conversion where we can reach out to re-engage them to try to reduce this zero conversion figure. Based on our data so far, this needs to happen within three to six months to ensure that we get there in time. Your team that delivers adolescent prevention services is crucial in ensuring success and making sure the team is equipped with the right knowledge and training, having positive attitudes towards this service being important in helping us to end the AIDS epidemic, and also to have their apprehensions in providing PrEP addressed, whether it's doubts on whether PrEP will produce more behavioral disinhibition, is key to adolescents being able to access HIV prevention services that they need. My penultimate slide on how we can make adolescent prevention services, which many people understandably feel can be very labor intensive and tedious in pandemic times where manpower and resources can be very limited, is stratifying the services you provide. Young people are not at uniform risk throughout their adolescence. And these are some strategies we are thinking about at our center at Chulalongkorn University to match service delivery to different risk periods. 
For the 20% that we've seen from our data continue to be fully engaged in services, we anticipate in the future that it may be possible to set up a postal service where they receive HIV self-test kits, PrEP, condoms, and are provided telephone consultations at intervals. Whereas those with moderate adherence can still access regular in-person clinic visits, perhaps with HIV self-testing kits used to help speed up in-clinic times. We've learned during the COVID-19 pandemic that it can be difficult to keep tabs on those that are lost to follow up and having a database of those that are missing or lost, utilizing peers to help re-engage them with services is important so that we keep as many cases as possible HIV negative for as long as possible. One of my colleagues presenting is presenting a post at APAC this year about information we have learned on adolescent attitudes towards HIV self-testing in 15 to 90 year olds in our services, poster number 76 if you're interested. My final point on this slide is that given the pandemic times we are living in, having contingency plans in place on what aspects your service are important to run regardless of lockdowns, such as PrEP dispensation and HIV testing, versus those that can be shifted to modified services, such as linkage to hormone affirming care and counseling that we may be able to do partly online, versus the services that are probably better to be suspended during lockdown, such as group activities and camps, can really help you to streamline your service delivery to focus on what your priority what your priorities are when times become challenging. So in summary, I hope you've had an opportunity to think in listening to this presentation of the, important, the importance of meeting adolescents where they are to engage them in PrEP services and to be sensitive towards the multiple layers of stigma that they face being conscious of and doing what you can to work around parental consent requirements if this is relevant to your settings, supporting them to navigate services, thinking about strategies on how you will ensure you'll retain them in services as much as possible and re-engage those lost to follow up, and finally to prepare your team for prep delivery to this important key population. Thank you for your attention.